Today on the Infinite Loop Show, there are Mac viruses, people. But there's a fix. Okay, but there are Mac viruses. You hear me? We are no longer safe. It's all over. I mean, sacrifice the virgins. <laughs> it's going to be okay, really. We'll get through this on the Infinite Loop Show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Infinite Loop Show, episode number 12. I am Michael Gaines. And I am Casey Coughlin. With the versions. No. <laughs> the only virgins? virgins. I only hang out with virgins. <laughs> Do you really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Until they're sacrificed. <laughs> yeah, I, I go through a lot of friends. What? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, really? <laughs> what kind of friends are you hanging out with? Um... Hey, so about this Mac Trojan. About this Mac Trojan. So I saw this just like two seconds before we started recording. It's on CNET. This is breaking news. It, We're coming we, at you with breaking news. We may be the first podcast that's reporting this. Camera's there. Oh my there. gosh. So, yeah, CNET wrote up that there are more than 600,000 Macs infected with, uh, with a flashback botnet. Mm-hmm. So let's break that down. 600,000 max. Is that a lot? Yeah, that's a lot. It's significant. <laughs> it will be significant. <laughs> there's, a, there's a chart on here from Dr. Webb. It says that the United States has 56.6% of them, and then the rest of them are spread out around the world. Um, I think Canada has the second highest with 19.8%, and then uh, the UK with 12.8%. Not that that really matters. Point is, here's what happens. Uh, if you go to a website that's infected with this, and you have Java, was it Java turned on, right? Yeah, you have to have either Java, Java or Flash. Uh, there apparently is vulnerabilities in both that in both. it will attach to. Okay, and it'll ask for your admin password. If you put it in, which you're not supposed to do, why would you put in your admin password for a website? Right. You know, I don't think a lot of people are going to even get to that line of logic. Probably I think, not. A, you know, Mac users, we've had it good for a while, and so they're going to be, uh, what the, you know, what could this possibly be? Nothing, you know, nothing serious ever comes through. I don't have to be <laughs> as cautious as a Windows user. So, whatever. And then B, um, since Macs ask for your password for literally everything mm -hmm. every install any change in the preferences so i think a lot of people almost have this kind of fatigue where they're just like okay fine you know just like do it and <laughs> get it over with it's true uh if so if you've got job installed that'll ask for your admin password now it says in the article here that's on cnet that the mal it's I'm going to quote this. This is from uh, Stephen Musil. It says, The mal malware will request an admin password, and if one is supplied, it will install its package of code into the applications folder. If a password is not offered, the malware... Mal <laughs> I can't say that word. The malware will install to the user accounts where it can run in a more global manner. So I think that's backwards, but okay. Yeah, that almost sounds like well. Because if it's I mean, if it's really, installed you need in the it, password for any installation. So I don't see how it can still go through with just a different install. Yeah, I have I to know. look into this. But anyway, um, it says once installed, the flashback will inject code into web browsers and other applications like Skype to harvest passwords and other information from those programs' users. So it's a password grabbing Trojan. Yay! <laughs> That's what we need. Mm -hmm. This is how, uh, if, if you ever wonder how your, your bank account or, or, or your friend's bank accounts or something gets hacked, this is usually how it's done. There's a there's a bot or, or something, some sort of Trojan on the system. That's, yeah, it's installed on the system and then f uh, feeds back info. Mm -hmm. And then people can just log into your account. Now, if you... See, here's the thing. Like, my bank has a, a system in which if you log into a machine that's not on their whitelist, 
then you have to identify yourself, not just with a password, mm -hmm. but with some personal information. And with so, the security questions that you've made when you set up the right, account? Right, which those themselves can be passed through, not necessarily with this, but if, if the Trojan is smart enough, it can do that. But this is how, this is how things happen. But a smart this is why we can't can have nice it. things. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> we can't have nice things. Uh, Apple's 3D camera concept. Um, this is interesting. There are 3D cameras out there. I've seen them. I've played with them from Sony and everything. Mm -hmm. But what's, what Apple is trying to do is it's trying to break down a 3D image into its components. And allow you to separate foregr the foreground object from the background object mm -hmm. so you can you can pull a face out of um out of an image because the camera will be smart enough to realize that from the nose to you know, maybe the side of the head or where you know wherever the focus is is an object mm -hmm. and anything from from a particular point back will be uh the background be it a wall of trees yeah, sky yeah. that sort of photoshop's thing. been able to do this for at least one version. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I want to say CS4 was able to do this. But right. I know for a fact CS5 can. Um, and, yeah, so it's not entirely a 3D camera. It's not going to take pictures in 3D. But it's more or less a technology to recreate or build, you know, 3D images from, scra from mm -hmm. existing images. From objects. So. Mm-hmm. So this will be interesting. I I really like to see this, but the, I don't really have a. Well, I guess I could have a use for it if I want to take a picture of somebody or something, and I want to just pull the front image out, the front object out, be it a person, mm -hmm. an object, and it's almost like having a built-in blue screen, green screen. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. So, and as a matter of fact, this this may even be revolutionary enough if this technology does what it's Would supposed it be to do. resolutionary? <sighs> Hold on, let's start re-recording because that was really bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. No, you won't have to film in front of a green screen anymore. If the cameras are smart enough to pull an object out, you don't need that anymore. Uh, and yeah, no, the built-in camera with photo booth on the Max can do like a really bad job of this currently. Mm -hmm. um, where they there's filters for photo booth that allow you know take out the background and put in like a roller coaster or mm -hmm. something around from around the the person, and it does like a really sketchy jagged job of this, but. I mean, it's there, and it's and it's kind of like step one of the of what mm -hmm. they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. I wonder if this technology is just going to be in like eyesight cameras that come with IMAX, or if they're going to try and build this technology into into real cameras. I'd imagine it's probably just going to be webcams on mics, uh, iPads, and iPhones. Mm -hmm. Probably, we'll see. Yeah. Um. So Larry Page had a little interview mm -hmm. and. Uh, let slip apparently that the, his whole feud with Steve Jobs was all for show. That, That's what he says. Yeah. Well, and well, all we have to go on really is him now. So, huh. But in Steve Jobs' uh, memoir, the uh, or biography, um, at the very end, you know, they say that, or Steve Jobs says that he's going to, like, go nuclear war on <laughs> on, on Google Android, or Android mm -hmm. uh, that you know until his dying breath that they're going to fight this and fight you know that Android's a straight rip off of iOS but now Larry Page is uh, claiming that that was all for show to uh, kind of I guess rally the base and build sales do you believe this no not really yeah I don't believe it I either mean, that because maybe if it was just a little bit, but it was such like such an impassioned kind of feud. I just don't see all of that being for naught. The way that I see it is, Steve is very protective. Was very protective about everything that that Apple did, which is kind of funny considering the fact that everything was sort of 
<laughs> adopted from Xerox. <laughs> See how Very clever I was right there? I didn't say stolen. It no. was it was taken from Xerox. I mean, it, it just mm-hmm. was. So, but the, but the thing is, is that was Xerox really going to do anything with this? I think that was the problem originally, is that Xerox had but this they, technology, but they didn't know what right, to do with it. They weren't doing anything. They didn't know how to market it or how to forward it. And Steve saw that and saw the value in it, and so they literally did move forward with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but since then, they had never really done that with any other technologies or companies. Yeah. You know, it was just kind of getting that initial foothold, and then they were able to snowball from there. Yeah. Yeah. So now that iOS is established, uh, Mac OS X is established, he's very protective of it. And I can understand that. You you come to the market with something revolutionary, and then somebody just completely rips it off. And I, I did a little research on Android. Android was not supposed to be what it is today. In no, its, in I its know. Initial, it looked uh, like uh, BlackBerry. Bill. Yeah, it did. It but, was going to be closer to BlackBerry because that was the leading smartphone before the, the iPhone came out. Mm-hmm. And so really that's all anybody had to go on. That's what kind of like the tunnel they were um, going through and, and looking at and like, well, it's it's obviously it has to have a keyboard. Mm-hmm. Hello. And obviously it has to be like this. You know, and Apple came along and just blew all of those notions out of the water and then suddenly, magically, Android looks like the <laughs> iPhone. That's convenient. Yep. Uh, Google earns 80% of its mobile revenue from iOS. And only twenty yeah. percent from Android. This, this Apparently. is well. I, are we surprised by this? Not really. Um, I mean, yes and no. I mean, no because there are a heck of a lot of iOS users, and we know that iOS users uh, are more likely to buy apps than mm-hmm. any other mobile users. Um. But then again, you know, it's it's from Google and Android is, you know, Android. I mean, they only have the Android market. Um, and we, and iOS users, we don't really have the Android marketplace. But we have some apps that are made by Google in our app store. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like, how did that even come to be? But... The way that it works, the way that's broken down is that, um, well, this is the way I understand it, is that iOS just has the stronger foothold than, than Android does. And in my opinion, from from what people have said to me that are Android users, very few people pay for apps yeah. when they're on Android. And mm-hmm. a lot of people pay for apps when they're on iOS. So there's this culture yes. with Google Simply because of the fact that they, they do put out a lot of stuff for free that people with Android phones seem to go, well, if everything else that Google does is free, why should I pay for anything? And but I've, yeah, I've it's heard kind that of from- that culture, like you said, um, where a lot of, it's, it's one of those things that's on the pros and cons list when people are looking at iOS versus Android. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a, oh, it's a walled garden, and oh, you have to pay for all your apps. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I could just go get an Android, and it'll be cheaper. Uh, apps will be either cheap or free, you know, and there's more apps. It's an open marketplace. Sure. So, you know, that's that's one of those things. And so then it builds that culture where Android users are like, oh, God, I have to pay for something? <laughs> like, you know, like that's... A crime against humanity. Well, there's a, there's a chart on Apple Insider basically showing... Uh, well, the, the, the source is uh, Andrew Lib, Apple, uh, and Piper Jaffray. And and they're saying here, as of 11-17-2011, there are six, 6.7 million app downloads from the Android store. And... No, wait. It's six, no, it's 6.7 billion. Sorry. Um, on the App Store, the Apple App Store, it's 18 billion. That's a lot. 18.5 billion. Mm-hmm. And total gross revenue on the Android market is 341 million. App Store 4.9 billion. And then it goes on and on from there. Well, here this, this is an interesting statistic. Page of developers from the Android market 239 million. App Store 3.4 billion dollars paid out to developers. Now, 
breaking that down, there are more apps on the App Store. So, of course, there's going to be more more uh, money paid out to developers just because there are mm-hmm. more developers. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, we already know that. Yeah. We know there's there's more... Well, actually, it might be closer, but I think there's still more apps total on the uh, Apple App Store than there is on the Android Marketplace. Mm-hmm. And we know, I mean, there's been several reports of developers when they choose which platform to develop for that, you know, it's more enjoyable and that they, they it's just a better experience developing for iOS than anything else. And look, I'm an, I'm an, an, an iOS developer. I looked into developing for Android and I just went, oh, hell no. I have to do <laughs> this? Really? This is, this is the development environment for Android? No. I'd rather actually develop for Windows than develop for Android. It's that bad. Hey, now. And I can go into that, but I won't, because we're going to move on to something else that... (laughs) Something that I I mentioned last week, which is that Baldur's Baldur's Gate Enhanced Edition was coming to the iPad. It turns out that it's also coming to the Mac. Yay! So, good for gaming on the Mac. I'm happy Mm -hmm. about this. Although... I, I'd have to say that I would probably wind up getting the Mac version instead of the iOS ver- or the iPad version just because of the controls. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, you're going to have your standard you know, PC controls with the Mac, but mm-hmm. the iPad, it's going to be kind of like... I'd imagine it's, it'll be like, a, what is it, chaos, order and chaos? Mm-hmm. You know, where the, the controls, they're, I mean, they're pretty good for what it is, and they're, and they're there, and they kind of disappear and... and and then come back as you know you tap in the general area where they should be but you're not unless they pull something crazy you're not going to get more advanced than that like a physical game controller um maybe apparently apple is reportedly working on one for the iphone so if they can just scale this up to the ipad it will totally not be a gigantic big bulky blown up game gear looking thing <laughs> which is what this looks like for this, the iphone this has been one of the biggest gripes that i've had about gaming on the iphone is that i, I think it's yeah everybody and there's been third-party companies that try to come in and solve this problem with like i've seen little like suction cup oh yeah you know joysticks <laughs> or button like to give you the physical sensation on the uh, on the glass or or add on cases like this the one uh stated here in the article uh, i believe is on mac rumors it looks like a big game gear that was just kind of cased around the iphone Mm -hmm. so that the iphone screen is in the middle where like a game gears uh screen would be and then you have the physical um controls and, and buttons on on either side hey props to you for mentioning the game gear in the first place why <laughs> it's not that old not, not well, well yeah it is it was like 20 years ago no yeah no. sega game gear sure that was really? around 94 God. something like that i remember having one and i remember yeah i had yeah. one too i didn't Wow. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I think that the lack of physical buttons on an iPhone are a big problem for gaming. And I've got I've got a PSP. I won't go to a Vita. I mm. refuse to go to a Vita because just I, I I don't like carrying around two gaming units. I already have the phone. No, I do what yeah, I can with no, the it's, phone. It's, and it's silly. Like when I was younger, I would carry my Game Boy around with me everywhere. But now, like. I, it just seems really silly to have like a Game Boy or uh, Vita, you know, my purse along with my iPhone and my iPad. Mm-hmm. The way that I see it <clears throat> is that if you're going to develop for a platform, if you're I, this is, goes back to what I said last week. So if you're an indie developer and you're trying to get into gaming. Mm-hmm. Or you're trying to reach people, even even if you're a well-known developer, and you're trying to reach people, you want to mm-hmm. go with something like an iPhone or an iPad game. Mm-hmm. But then why why can't Apple have some sort of uh, interface, Bluetooth or otherwise, where you can use like a PS3 wireless controller, an yeah. Xbox controller, yeah. or some adapter that'll allow you to use it? And it doesn't. 
I don't, in my opinion, it doesn't kill the need for, um, or it, it doesn't kill the, um, the experience of using an iPhone or an iPad for gaming. In fact, it enhances it. Because let's yeah. face it, touch gaming sucks. It just does. <laughs> I don't want it to. But <clears throat> I don't want yeah. it to either, but it just does. I mean, it, it works great for Angry Birds and such, but... Uh-huh. Yeah, those types of games. You're trying to play something like... Let, let's say you're trying to play... Um, it's not out. They say they're working on it, but let's say Quake comes out for the iPad. I would oh. love for Quake to come out for the mm-hmm. iPad. If it comes out for the iPad, what are you, you going to do? You're going to run around with your thumbs... You no, know, on the well, screen again. And, it's probably going to be a lot like Order and Chaos. Yeah, I, you I know suppose. those those types of RPG uh, MMO games where you know you have your basic, you know, W A S D or arrow keys mm-hmm. and and the mouse movements uh, or something else, you know, for clicking and and then you also have like a chat window. It's really hard to recreate on. Not only a touch interface, but just a piece of glass. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be a while. Yeah, and I'm not sure. I mean, I'm sure Apple's kind of weighing the need for that with other stuff. You know, like mm-hmm. its priority level is probably probably going low. Up and down. But I would yeah. think until we get haptic feedback, I don't think that's going to change. Mm. Mm. there's a report that says that apple has the master decryption key for icloud which essentially means that if you put anything on icloud Mm -hmm. and you encrypt it apple can Mm -hmm. say well guess what we're gonna decrypt it because the feds or somebody needs it Yay! <laughs> this is fantastic and because I was so happy that they didn't do this since Dropbox did, and I could, you know, safely recommend iCloud for people to mm-hmm. use as opposed to Dropbox. Now we don't have to worry because they're both going to kowtow to the feds or police or whoever comes knocking for really any reason at all. Mm-hmm. Um, Dropbox has said they they will give up users' information if asked. I don't even think they need a search warrant. Dropbox is just going to lay down and give it to them. And now, apparently, Apple will do this too? This is what I want to know, is that what is it going to take for, for either Dropbox or, or Apple to even know that you've got something objectionable on their system? This is what worries me, is yeah. that if they have the master decryption key... Do they go through people's stuff and, and look for obje- objectionable items? I hope not. And, you know, it's not like their system or anything would be flagged when you upload to it. So they would have to literally go through, I think, with a fine tooth comb. Mm-hmm. Now, if they're doing this on a regular basis, that just really kind of screams wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean,. In every sense. Right. So, we're just going to have to... I, I don't know. I mean, would you... No, first off, I don't share anything on um, on either of these systems that are going to be a problem. Oh, you mean when you... the uh, When you can share links to your Dropbox for people to download yeah, stuff? Yeah, for example, if I say to you here, here's something, I just want to share it with you. Mm-hmm. And, and then that's it. I mean, is that going to be a problem for most users? Just like, you know, drag and drop, here's the thing. I don't know. I mean, I've I've used, myself, I've used this a couple times for, because I keep a lot of stuff um, in, well, in both, Mm -hmm. in Dropbox and iCloud. And since Mobile Me went away, you know, I've been putting more stuff in Dropbox, but it's pretty convenient when I can just, you know, give a link to like one thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I've done this for work. Um, I've done it for you know family or friends. If I've got like my resume on Dropbox or something, and I can just say, "Hey, here's a link." You know, instead of it, especially if I'm out somewhere, and I can just do that from my phone right. from the Dropbox app, and I can just send a link and email, and then they can you know take care of it themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, uh, but I mean, as far as 
uh, I mean, Apple's always been really on the side of the consumer and and privacy. And for this, just this doesn't feel like. I don't know. It doesn't feel like it's Apple. I mean, they've always been so pro privacy, mm-hmm. literally. I mean, they've been asked from carriers and feds before to to give up consumer uh, information, and they never have. They've never once done anything like that. You know, always on the side of the consumer, and now it just it almost feels like they're really kind of reverting into something i don't want to see them revert into yeah i don't know if maybe they are doing this on their own if they're forced into it well not for (laughs) i I shouldn't say forced into it but they're doing this because they want to comply with what's going on legally in the world right now or at least the united states is that if there's something objectionable uh and and i don't know if we're talking about movies or music or something worse yeah, well, it probably has a little bit, at least a little bit, to do with the whole uh, mega upload fiasco Possibly. and SOPA and, you know, all, all of that. I mean, they're probably getting hit just like Congress and everybody else is with lobbyists for music and movie um, industries. Mm-hmm. So... I don't know. I, I'm not too worried about this. I, I know that, that you have a concern about the culture of Apple itself and, and what this means for... Yeah, no, Apple. it feels like it's... it's If it isn't something big now, it this is really a big step in that direction for, for Apple to really turn into something that they never have been before. Yeah. Are, are, are you going to stop using iCloud because of this? No, probably not. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's still really convenient to back up, you know, my iOS devices <laughs> and share data between them using iCloud. I'm not going to go back to tethering to my laptop every time I want to, you know, get something off my phone and onto my iPad. But mm. depending on where they take this, if this gets a whole heck of a lot worse, then I won't have a choice. Right. Well, it seems to me that any, anywhere you go nowadays is going to have this problem. I really hope not. I mm. mean, that just really feels like... It It feels like you've got a room in your house, and now the cops, the feds, they have a key to that room that they can mm-hmm. go into at any time. And yeah, no. that's the part of it that I don't like. I'm fine with there not being privacy on the web. Mm-hmm. You know, as far as social networks go and um, web archiving and, you know, I'm fine with that. You say something on the web and then it comes back to bite you in the ass. Well, then, you you know, that's your problem. You shouldn't have said it or posted those pictures or whatever. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's totally logical and understandable and I'm fine with that. Stuff like this where, you know, I'm entrusting a company. It's It's like... Say you buy a P.O. box from the post office, and then you come to find out that <laughs> this whole time they've been reading your mail before they put it right. in your P.O. box. Right. I, I, Which you're not supposed to do, but yeah, I do see your point. Yeah. That That's exactly what it feels like. Yeah. I mean, sure, it's still the web. Okay, great, if you really want to take it that far and say, you know, well, it's still web-based, so there shouldn't be any privacy. But these are like, these are like P.O. boxes. These are like little security boxes that I've, you know, either purchased or are getting through these companies, and I'm entrusting tr- them to just freaking not look over here and the, not, you know. The web is like the Wild West. People have said it before, and, and these are the sorts of things that I think we're going to have a problem with for now. Yeah. Unf- which, is, which is unfortunate. There's nothing that we can do about it at this point. I mean... Look at all the Occupy stuff. I mean, what did that change yeah. that much? <laughs> really? I mean, what are we yeah. going to do? Make memes about it. <laughs> That's true. All right. all right. Well, speaking of Steve Jobs, um, 
Kutcher seems to think he would make the perfect Steve Jobs in an upcoming uh, film about his life, not the one from Sony based on the Walter Isaacson book, uh, but a different one, rather. This is and, an indie uh, film, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's called just Jobs, mm-hmm. and Kutcher is set to play Steve Jobs. Mm-hmm. When I first heard about this, I literally laughed out loud and <laughs> really didn't think, okay, really? Like, Kelsta thinks he's going to be the great Steve Jobs. This is, <laughs> is going to be silly. And if you look in the art, what was this on? Apple Insider, I think. Um, the article has, like, a picture of Kutcher side by side with an early, early picture of Jobs in his 20s. Mm-hmm. I had to really look. I mean, they look identical. It's scary. With uh, the, the, the small beard and the longer hair, Kutcher, his face and, you know, bone structure is just like Jobs. It's, it's really scary. I think they should change the name of the movie to That Apple Show. <laughs> that would be you fantastic. You get Wozniak just every, every other minute just going, you dumbass. <laughs> he's wearing shades totally and then their dad comes down and <laughs> berates them because they're not working I was, I was working a big That 70s Show fan huge I was for a little bit and then I kind of fell behind uh, but um but anyway yeah uh, this will be interesting to watch I, I mean like, I, it doesn't matter who's playing jobs I'm still gonna watch it <laughs> well I'm gonna watch it too but uh, what I was talking to Casey about before uh, we started recording is how much better is is uh, Kutcher gonna be than Noah Wiley was mm-hmm. because I thought Noah Wiley did a really good job he did a good job acting I mean and and I think we we kind of associate him with and think he looks like jobs now after seeing him in that role Mm -hmm. when i first saw that movie for the first time i didn't think he looked like steve at all very Mm -hmm. much i mean it was close but not not nearly as close as as these pictures of ashton kutcher yeah i haven't so we'll see if like his acting's up to par but the looks are dead on i haven't watched pirates of silicon valley in a long time should watch that i should it's a fantastic movie (laughs) it is I highly recommend it. Foxconn Recruiter says that we're getting new iPhones in June because he says so. Well, then, let it be so. His claim is that they're hiring a lot for a June release. Mm-hmm. Now, Casey and I talked about this yesterday. And, and after we were done, Casey said, ah, we should have recorded that. So here we are. We're doing this again. <clears throat> <laughs> I forgot what we said now. Here's, here's the, the logic that I've got. WWDC is coming up in June. Mm-hmm. And more than likely, we're going to get iOS 6 beta mm-hmm. in June. If the new iPhone is coming out in June, the evidence suggests that that's wrong. Because by this point, in the in the in the previous history of of iPhone releases pre-releases, we've seen parts. Mm-hmm. We've we've known what companies are making what components, mm-hmm. and we're getting none of that yet. Yeah, well, there's no hardware rumors yet. Right. Well, we've gotten iOS six rumors uh, from the user agent data from was it TechCrunch? Ars Technica. Ar- yeah, Ars Technica. Okay, um, but there. The rumors of the hardware haven't been as much as as we would be normally seeing about three months out. Right. Um, Now, last year with the 4S, they released it in October. Mm -hmm. This would be really, really weird and really unlike anything they've done before to... To release it, to move the release date up one year and then go back to the previous release date two years ago. Mm-hmm. I have to agree if with they that. move a date, they stick to that. They don't do like a fluke year or, you know, hey, we're just running behind or just kidding. Or They stick to their <laughs> dates. Anytime they update a product, you know, they have, they have um, dates and months where you can count on certain products being dropped or updated Mm -hmm. um it's always been that case and and they stick to those schedules 
So I'm, you know, despite this uh, rumor, and there was another rumor, the rumor uh, last week about the iPhone 5's screen still being 3.5 inches, mm-hmm. but they were also rumored a June launch. Mm-hmm. I really doubt that. And again, you know, we'd be hearing more about this. The- I mean, it's... It's not weird that they would release iOS 6 at WWDC. Um, they almost entirely, they almost always release that separate of the hardware. Even mm-hmm. when they had announced hardware in June, they wouldn't release it in June. Right. One of the things that I was saying last night is if, if, the, if there's going to be a new iPhone, an iPhone 5, not a 4S, not like a 4.5, so to speak, but a 5, is that it would have to have some new features in it. Mm-hmm. And what people do is they look through new releases of, of iOS or Mac OS X, and they look for clues for what's coming up. And so far, again, there's none of that. There's nothing about NFC. There's nothing no. about uh, in any kind of new hardware. There, there's nothing that we've heard so far. And so for the iPhone to come out in two months, I'm, I'm not buying it. And another, yeah, another no. point that I said to Casey last night is, if iOS 6 beta is coming in June, then wouldn't you want to put your new phone out with your new OS? So Yes and no. I mean, last year they didn't. Uh, iOS 5 came out just before the actual new hardware did and, and and it really doesn't matter. I mean, you know, they don't always release a new Mac OS with new Macs. Mm-hmm. Um it's it's But that's not, different. I don't think it's it's so important for the OS to be released with the new hardware. Hmm. I the way that I see it is that if phones phones are a little different. And you may be right, and, and you are definitely right about about the new um, about new Macs. Is that new Macs aren't necessarily put out with uh, new OSs, but with phones, you usually bake new features into the new OS, and those new features come mm-hmm. with new phones. Yeah. And the market for phones is different than computers, where you want people to buy the phones because they're they cost less, a lot less. Mm-hmm. And so I'm not I'm not sure we're gonna have to see what happens in a few months. But the way that I see it right now is this just isn't gonna happen that way. I th- I think we're gonna get iOS six and the new iPhone at the same time. But that that could be a coincidence. No, and you're shaking your head. No. No, we'll get iOS six in June, and then we'll get the new phone in the fall. Well, well, we'll get iOS six beta in June. But when will it be released? Yeah. That's what I'm saying, is that iOS um, 6 Final may come out with a new phone. Uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, well, I mean, when did they release it last year? They released it in the fall still. It was like September or something. Something and like then It was yeah. just before the new phone. Mm-hmm. I, I don't see why um, they would want to... I mean, they re- they really don't have to. Mm-hmm. So they can release it whenever they want, and <laughs> they're Apple. Can they can do what they want. Still download it like crazy, and then they'll still buy the new phone like crazy. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Alrighty. Um, well, this I thought was pretty interesting, mainly because I work in an enterprise environment, and we are currently looking for a nice. Uh, mobile management system. RIM's new BlackBerry Fusion software will apparently manage not only the Blackberries, but the Androids and the iPhones as well. What does this do? So it's kind of like Lion Server for Macs and oh, okay. uh, devices. It um, allows you to uh, remote wipe, um, uh, remote, you know, delete apps or profiles, create profiles and push them down, push updates, uh, messages and stuff to uh, to the phones and mobile devices. 
uh, pretty much, I mean, you know, literally manage them. Okay. Um, and all of this apparently is web-based. It's, it's a web-based software in the browser. You can download it from RIM for a 60-day trial. And then after that, it goes to 99 bucks a year per user or 4 bucks a user per month. That's a lot. This is actually kind of cheap. Is it? Uh, yeah, even MC for enterprise, I think this is expensive. MDMs are expensive. Just like really all enterprise solutions are crazy expensive. Hmm. Okay. Nearly, well, this, this is related to something that we brought up last week. Is that um, last week we said that more than half of American households own an Apple product. Mm-hmm. And uh, today we read this report that says <laughs> almost half of the corporations in the United States are giving Macs to employees. Not Apple products, but Macs. Mm-hmm. And this is far different than years ago when. Apples used to be scarce in the business. Oh, yeah. Well, they'd, like, laugh. I mean, even my company is still very hard to get a Mac in. Um, very, it's just difficult. They just don't want to. Not a lot of people know uh, the platform. I mean, I'm the only one in our IT mm-hmm. that knows my way around a Mac. And, and so, because IT doesn't know it, then they're you know, afraid, and I mean, like consumers are as well. But a big complaint, I think, also, not only, you know, the, the fact that they have to support them, but also the cost. Mm-hmm. Macs are traditionally way more expensive than your average PC. But apparently, a uh, a new caveat to that has been the MacBook Air. Yep. Lower and the I can price definitely, point. Yeah, no, I can definitely speak to this. Um and a lot of the newer Macs in my company that have squeaked in mm-hmm. have been MacBook Air specifically for our salespeople who travel all the time. Mm-hmm. They have they need a lightweight laptop, um, you know, with a long battery life uh, that doesn't add a whole lot of weight to their uh, carry-on bag, and you know, isn't going to be a huge burden. Mm-hmm. That's the MacBook Air. In a nutshell. And it runs Windows if they have to. And if they absolutely have to, they can run both, yes. I used to have a, a Windows laptop years ago. It was a Dell. It was awful. It was heavy. It was mm-hmm. it was just ugly. And now with the MacBook Airs, if this is going to be the, uh, the barrier to entry that's broken, yeah. then sure, of course, people are going to want MacBook Airs. And you, you sold one to your uh, to somebody at work, and... I've been hearing Apple. stories yeah. uh, for ever since they first came out years ago. I remember it was at Macworld Boston. I'm uh, not Macworld. Um, Podcamp Boston, and several people had them simply because they loved the fact that they didn't need heavy computing on the road. Mm-hmm. Now, people like you and me that may be doing media, that may be a different story. Yeah. But but for corporations, MacBook Air is just perfect. So it is. That's that's it's what's fantastic. Done. Yep. All right, so, and apparently starting April 20th, we'll have a whole lot more people, well, maybe not a whole lot more, but we'll have more people uh, rolling around with iPhones. Uh, A lot of the smaller U.S. carriers are going to be rolling out iPhones uh, with a $50 discount even. Mm -hmm. Most of these are going to have the 4 and the 4S, and uh, I know one in particular will have the 3GS since... The 3GS was a GSM only, and the 4 and 4S have CDMA, and most of these little guys are uh, CDMA. Mm-hmm. Um, I've never heard of any of these. Uh, <laughs> Entelos, Alaska Communications, Appalachian Wireless, CGI, or GCI, Cellcom, and Mantanuska Telephone Association. <laughs> Three of these are, are yeah, in Alaska. And so, yeah. <laughs> so, I guess the Verizon guy goes up to Alaska and says, can you hear me? And can you hear no. me? There's a moose. Hurry, okay. can you hear me? Apparently, yeah. Um, in some of these more rural areas, these oh are oh. it. And so, now they can have iPhones, too. Okay. Well, good. All right. <laughs> we're we're going to start our own little new segment here. I, I don't know exactly what we're going to call it yet because this is a work in progress, Yes. 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 Okay. 
we're going to bring our own topics to the table and, and not just talk about the news, uh, even though some of the news stuff is important. But one of the things that I was playing with over the last few days is speech recognition. And every few years, I go to try speech recognition on the Mac, and I play with it for a few <laughs> hours, and, and no matter what happens, I wind up turning it off and saying, this isn't worth it. I like it. I It definitely needs work. And it seems like it hasn't gotten any work in years. Um, but I I love it. I love, well, I love, you know, automation of all kinds. And um, even before Siri was in the iPhone, I was using this on my iMac, thinking I was just tough shit, you know. Yeah. I could get up in the morning and say, uh, iMac, open in gadget. Sure. And... You know, one that. out of one out of five times it'll do it. That's the so, problem. Is it's it's at one out of five times it doesn't always work. I was I was no, working okay. on my room today, and those of you watching the video may notice that I don't have the ugly paneling behind me anymore. And I was trying to get my system to um, to just do simple things while I was while I was wandering around in this general vicinity of the microphone, mm -hmm. and I would say. The computer, because the default is computer, I'd say, computer, open iTunes, and nothing would happen. Computer, open iTunes, nothing would happen. And and you could see that the, the little yeah. uh, voice recognition meter was, was blinking, so it knew the, that it, it, it was getting audio in. Mm -hmm. I had the window open, and chances are it was probably getting sounds from the window. So there's a way to calibrate it. I did that, and then it started yeah. working a little better. But still, I want something to listen and pull voice away from the ambient noise in the background and mm -hmm. so i could say computer play this album or something like that S yeah. similar to what siri would do like siri right, for the exactly. mac exactly it needs it needs a a touch of siri in there to kind of i think bring context but also um, be able to pull your voice out of the ambient noise because it def it works a it works better when you're closer to the mic, um, but I think a lot of these use cases for the Mac especially is going to be when you're doing stuff like you're doing when you're across the room and you're like you know Mac uh, play playlist blah 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 right that's exactly you know? what that's, I was trying to do and that's a that's what I would. Um, try to do and that's why i wanted to set it up so like when i get up in the morning i can tell my mac to start doing stuff as i'm getting ready mm -hmm. i don't have to go over to my computer and do stuff like i can just talk to it from across the room mm -hmm. yeah playlist is is actually one of the things that i was trying to do i was actually also trying to get it to start and stop the music mm -hmm. and i would say because I listen to the Skyrim soundtrack a lot it's mm -hmm. but sometimes i'll listen to metal i don't know it depends on <laughs> big gap there but um, i was trying to get this thing and you can the way that you do it is you can you can write an apple script that's easy yeah. anybody can do yeah. that and then the title of your apple script will be your voice uh command but just getting mm -hmm. this thing to recognize the built-in stuff was difficult enough and and i i've been saying this for years is that we have siri why not we just, have it now we have it now just <laughs> it can put be done. that in the mac can't be that difficult because the whole damn thing was written in Objective C. Just put it in, put it in the Mac. Yeah. No. Um. I don't know. Hopefully. I mean, I logic would say you know that they would want to put it on the Mac and they'd want to develop it for the Mac and they'd want to promote Siri like any of their technologies like FaceTime mm -hmm. you know they got that out to every platform as fast as they could to promote and push that technology forward I would think that they would want to do that with Siri now too mm -hmm. um, so I, I hope that really comes um, because I, I love I love using it and I hope that that comes so that when I you know, say, hey, look what I can do with my Mac. And then it fucking does what I <laughs> tell people it's supposed to do instead of making me look stupid. Yeah, it does. And and like I said, the ambient noise uh, doesn't help at all. So No. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. We're going to move on because we're running a little late. Um, apps. Uh, Shazam 5.0 was just dropped. And 
the way, what they're saying is got it's got faster tagging and startup. And one of the biggest problems that I have with both Shazam and sound tracking is that it takes forever for these apps mm-hmm. to fire up. As a developer, I don't understand why. Yeah. <laughs> because my my screens just they're boom 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 they just like show up. You don't want the user to wait, especially with these these sound app these song apps where it could be like the last ten seconds of the song. And mm-hmm. you're like, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, load. Yeah, no, a lot of the times that I'll be like, oh, well, I, I should get Shazam out and tag this, you know, when I'm in the car. And loading, yeah, loading, loading. And even like the, the process, when you finally get it loaded, the process of tagging it seems like it takes a long time. Well, you know what? That I can understand. That I just, just so long as it pulls in the data of those last few seconds of the song, Tagging it, the time that it takes to tag it doesn't bother me. It's just that initial startup okay, that hurts. Okay, so long as it catches it before it goes on to another yeah, song. Yeah, yeah. Or even, even uh, well, it's an app. I mean, it shouldn't have to do it. It shouldn't take more than a second for something like that to load. And and these graphics, it's like the time that it takes for the logos to come up. Don't put me in, in the state mm-hmm. where I'm waiting for a logo to disappear. Just give me yeah. the recorder so that I can get the song. I've lost songs like that. Mm. And it irks you because like, what was that? Yeah. And and sometimes you can look up the lyrics. Like if you catch the lyrics, you can just do a Google search on the lyrics and then you'll find the song. But sometimes you can't. No, a lot of times you can't. Yeah. So that that's my app for, for this week. What's yours? All right. My app is a fantastic app. I've been literally telling everybody about this for the last three or four days. Um, and I've heard a lot of reviews about it, so I'm going to do mine. Um, it's called Zombies Run. <laughs> it's on the App Store right now. It is kind of a an app that gamifies your workout to a certain degree, specifically walking and or running. Mm-hmm. Um, so you start the app. It has a, a story, and you can play this over music. So when I went on my run this weekend, I was playing Pandora and then playing this app over it. Um, so they're both running in the background. It starts off I'm with running. a story kind of like 28 Days Later or what have you, um, where zombies you know, have kind of taken over and there's a small enclave of people and you've got to get to them. So it, it has you, it tells you what's going on and the characters and everything and it says, oh, run to this point. You know, you can do it. And so then it kind of fades out and you're running. Yeah. And then periodically there's a, uh, like a computer voice that says, picked up batteries, picked up a <laughs> canister of clothing, picked up, you know, underwear, which is apparently you need fresh underwear, um, even when there's zombies. So, and then periodically it will come in and say, zombies detected. And at that point you need to run faster. Mm-hmm. So that the zombies don't get you, and if crap. you don't, if you don't yeah. run faster, then it goes, zombies fifteen meters, <laughs> zombies ten meters, and the closer they get, the louder this like growling gets over your music, until you know they either literally overtake you, and you lose the stuff that you've picked up, or if you've run fast enough for this whole time, which is usually like only a couple minutes. Um, then it says zombies evaded, and you can you know relax and walk or whatever. That's got to scare people. You have nightmares it's, about that if you do it too much. Maybe, but it's a damn good motivator. <laughs> you know, it is fun. <laughs> no, yeah, I was uh, I ran walked uh, a few miles this weekend, and man, you know it it worked. It's good. I love it. It's oh, fantastic. Cool. All right, we gotta go. We're running a little late. But that's yeah, you okay. gotta do another show. I do, but that's okay because okay. last week I didn't get started on that one until like an hour later. So. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. That Langley, he's not gonna, you know, get around to it. <laughs> All right. If you want to contact us, I am at Star Mike on Twitter. Casey is. I'm gonna do this. K a c e y k a s o. The Casey, not the cheese. That's right. If you want to reach the show's Twitter ID, it's at infinite loop tv and of course you can email us the infinite loop show at gmail.com i got it all right (laughs) yay you're such a big boy i know i am thanks i eat my spinach (laughs) all right we'll talk to you later 
Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.